All right. Good afternoon. My name is Jessie Kinsey. I'm a registered nurse and account manager with Mountain Pacific Quality Health. Today is July 6, 2022. It's worth a shot edition. And today we're going to talk about employee vaccine tracking resources and booster vaccinations. Next slide, please. As usual, a few housekeeping items. Um, please continue to share your webinar topics and clinician ideas or needs in the chat. And we'll continue to meet every Wednesday through the end of the year. And I have a polling question. Um, as you guys know we, know, we have been doing polling questions the last several weeks in effort to um, assist and better identify needs for long-term care uh, COVID-19 vaccination planning. So today's question, do you have an efficient manner of track tracking staff vaccination rates? Yes or no? And for those of you that indicate yes, there's a few folks joining in the waiting room there. There we go. Uh, for those of you that indicate yes, if you wouldn't mind sharing your method or if you're using a program or, or a computer module, if you wouldn't mind sharing those um, tools that you're using in the chat box, that would be wonderful. So again, quick polling question. Do you have an efficient manner of tracking staff vaccination rates? Yes or no? Now let's, uh, we have one person just join. All right, we can go ahead and end that poll, Mary. Thank you. All right. So it looks like the majority of you said yes. And again, if you wouldn't mind um, uh, sharing your process in the chat box, that would be great. All right, thanks, Mary. I see people with spreadsheets. Are these homegrown spreadsheets, Rachel? Yep, nice. Adjusting as you go, nice. All right, thank you guys. All right, as always, we'd like to extend many thanks to all of those speakers and partners and uh, attendees that continue to support the long-term care needs and participate in this series. Next slide, please. So with that, we will kick off the um, first segment. Looks like we're getting um, more replies, spreadsheets. OK, awesome, awesome. All right, so first topic, employee vaccine tracking resources, tackling the burden of paper. Next slide, please. So federal reg regulations. Uh, you know, that went into effect for all states really back in February and uh, essentially required nursing homes uh, that all staff needed to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19. However, the, the regulations allowed nursing homes to grant staff exemptions, as we all know. Now we're in the midst of trying to track and maintain that documentation long term. And um, that's kind of what I was hoping to share forward with you guys. Um, the regulations, among other things, um, again, those exemptions need to be uh, tracked. And it's, it's been an ongoing process. And as several of you have already noted, you know, there's been a lot of pen and paper, pencil and paper, manual labor, um, spreadsheets. And I'm hoping to share some, some resources that I identified with the group today. Let's see, next slide, please. So with that, as we, we look at vaccine auditing and staff vaccination requirements, we wanna make sure ultimately that we're not only meeting the requirements and in compliance, but we're survey ready and we're not um, burdening the staff. As I know, a lot of this, uh, the time to maintain these spreadsheets has really just been a tremendous feat. So um, with that, 
um, and we look at survey readiness, I just want to have a little reminder here that um, the survey agencies will now only be expected to perform, perform compliance reviews of the staff vaccine requirements during initial and recertification surveys and in response to complaint surveys. So, um, you know, prior, prior to, um, they were requesting to look at vaccination status at every entry. Um, that's going to be no longer. So um, this reduction in frequency is, is really um, to go back to the normal processes for oversight. And um, we can definitely look forward to that. But just a reminder that that, that has been a change when we look at survey preparedness. And uh, next slide, please. So vaccine audit resources. This is kind of the, the, the main show I wanted to share with everybody. As a lot of folks are using pen and paper and really spending a lot of time updating those Excel spreadsheets routinely, I'm sharing forward that ADP, for anyone that uses that ADP um, payroll application in your facility, they actually have a free add-on module if you are a current ADP payroll user that um, contains a reporting dashboard. It's all web-based and it extends to mobile use by the employee to track vaccination status. And what I found, which was, I thought, super convenient and helpful, was there was a two-way feed. So as an employee employer, you can insert send the employee notifications of, um, hey, we're still looking for your, your vaccine status. Do you have an update? Then the employee can take a picture and send that information back. And that'll be uploaded um, through the dashboard. And through that dashboard, it creates flags for who needs followed up um, or who needs maybe information uploaded, um, uh, maybe new employees, uh, maybe you're making sure that you have all that information in the right place at the right time, who's eligible for um, booster vaccinations maybe. That's all built into this dashboard. And I put this one at the top of my list because it caught my eye that it was a free dashboard for current EDP payroll users. So again, just wanted to share that one forward. Um, uh, next slide, please. Some other resources for tracking uh, vaccine status for employees, two additional modules, Return Safe and Paycheck Flex. These two modules, uh, they have a small monthly fee and it depends on the um, uh, size of your facility and the number of employees that you would enroll in these, these software programs. Return Safe, again, it has a two-way tracking. Um, for vaccine status, but this one was uh, caught my eye because it also had testing results um, where you could prompt the employee to upload testing results uh, into this software. And then um, you could also use it for alerts for potential exposures. Paycheck Flex, that system offered um, much of the, the same as Return Safe and ADP. Um, but it also, it had kind of a extended um, feature for tracking unvaccinated employees and tracking those tests from week to week and uploading those tests. tests. And um, that Paycheck Flex, from what I understood, it would um, text the employees and then you could gather that information two ways or you know, both ways and then upload that to the dashboard as well. So both of these systems, once they're loaded into the dashboard, then that would enable you to run additional reports off of that um, gathered data. Uh, next slide, please. So vaccine management platform, a few things I wanted to share forward. When you go to choose the platform, if you're looking towards perhaps transitioning to an electronic platform. Again, the number of employees, because that could affect a potential cost, um, ultimately um, affecting a, a budget. Um, vaccine tracking features to include testing workflow. 
So a lot of the modules that are out there, uh, they don't necessarily track the testing workflow. And as we have mandates based on outbreaks and our unvaccinated staff, we know that that has to be a priority. And tracking that is a lot of times the bulk of our, our labor on a weekly basis. So be mindful if you, um, when you look at these different platforms, if they contain the ability to track the testing. And then the vaccine tracking and integration to your existing system. Some of these modules, again, like ADP, it's in there. It's built into your, your system that you already have. So um, again, just be, be mindful of, of those elements. Next slide, please. So some questions that came up right away as we look at some of this technology and um, using this for potentially tracking employee vaccination status and testing. Are these apps permissible by law? Vaccine tracking is actually permissible under federal law, regardless of a center's policy. And they can be used to track vaccination status. And um, the, the recommendation really is just to make sure that that information is treated confidentially and it's stored separately. The next question, does the HIPAA privacy rule prohibit businesses or individuals from asking customers or clients if they receive the vaccine? And the answer is no, the privacy rule does not prohibit any person, uh, including HIPAA covered entities from asking whether an individual has received a vaccine. Next slide, please. Right, so here are the resources and the links of um, everything I've, I've covered. And I'm going to go ahead and see if I can stick that in the chat box. And feel free to, let me see if I can, oh yeah, I'll stick it in there for you guys. Um, feel free to snag those out of chat. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Next slide, please. So with that, I will introduce you to uh, Dr. Kunzweiler. You may remember him from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he uh, is our Chief Medical Officer for Mountain Pacific Quality Health. And he comes to us with more than 40 years of healthcare experience. And uh, we are so appreciative to have him at the table once more. And he's going to visit with us about um, uh, COVID-19 boosters. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to give everybody a boost up today. First slide. All right, please. So there's a tendency to say, well, I've had my immunizations. I went through my, my two shots, and maybe I even got my first booster, and I'm just tired of it. I'm OK. Uh, everything's getting back to normal anyway. Do we really need this? And the answer is, yeah, we really do. Um, a lot of hesitancy still comes from people being afraid that maybe the vaccine isn't safe. Uh, so that's the first question. Is the vaccine dangerous? No, no, it's not. By now, worldwide, millions of people, literally millions, have been vaccinated. And the number of significant reactions, other than you know, feeling achy and low-grade fever and fatigue for a day or two. But significant reactions, uh, reactions that you would say this person should not get the vaccine again, turn out to be about six people per million. That is, that ranks right up there as the safest vaccines that, that we know of. These are, these are very safe. Um, there are no medications you can take that, that have numbers like that. Vaccination is one of the real triumphs of modern medicine. Um, there is unfortunately a lot of attention paid uh, to people who have an ax to grind, who are against vaccinations for one reason or another. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation, especially on social media. Um, and, and unfortunately, even people who should know better, uh, people who have been educated in healthcare, uh, sometimes uh, 
get a platform and and say that uh, vaccinations are unsafe and that they're a plot and all sorts of sort of crazy stuff, but they are very safe. Um, and millions and millions of people can attest to that now. And we're, the, if you go back to the first people who trialed the vaccines, you know, we're, we're talking a couple of years out now and people are doing fine. Next slide. So why, why do we have to keep getting boosters? Well, it's because our immunity tends to wear off. Uh, if you think about it, if you uh, cut yourself and you go to an urgent care or you go to an emergency room, people are gonna ask you, when was your last tetanus booster? And depending on the type of injury you have, uh, if it's been uh, more than 10 years for routine kinds of relatively clean cuts, or more than five years for puncture or contaminated uh, dirty wounds, they're going to uh, strongly recommend that you get a tetanus booster. Now, I've been in medicine for 40 years. I saw one case of tetanus, and that was in medical school, and I've never seen one since. And I've treated, I don't know, several hundred at least uh, cuts, lacerations, puncture wounds, and nobody ever got tetanus. And it's because we are so good about getting people uh, boosted. And, and you need a tetanus booster every 10 years or so to keep your immunity up. Our, our immune system has built-in memory, but just like our own memory, it can fade with time. And every disease is a little bit different. If you think about uh, like polio, you have to get your initial vaccine and then you get a booster uh, at an, a time interval after that, and then looks like pretty much you're set for life. Uh, other vaccines, you know, you, you have to get boosted to keep reminding your immune system that this is a pathogen and, and that you have to be prepared to fight it. Um, so you have to just think about this just like you would any other, like the tetanus vaccine. And the vaccines have returned us to a much more normal life than we were 18 months ago. So the boosters will keep us uh, on the right track, keep us back in a, a more normal uh, living situation. Next slide, please. So does everybody need a second booster? Not necessarily. It is recommended uh, for everybody who is 50 and older. Um, so this is, uh, essentially this is your fourth shot. Remember the initial series was uh, two injections and then it was recommended that you get a booster after that. Uh, and that's being re recommended for children as well. Uh, but this next booster, uh, it, it's been found that um, immunity wanes more in older people. And so 50 years old and older, you should get your fourth booster. And then anybody age 12 and older who has some immune compromise, either for medication that they're taking or, for, or because of some disease they have of their immune system, uh, or even some chronic illness like diabetes would be a good example. Um, if you're not certain, if you fall into one of those categories, you can. Uh, get on the web and go to the Center for Disease Control's uh, website, and they've got a little questionnaire that you can go through. It's very simple. You answer a couple of simple questions, and it will give you advice about whether or not you should get a booster. Next slide, please. So what's the point? Why, why do this? Is it effective at all? Uh, and the answer to that is yes, boosters do really work. We are, uh, sometimes it seems like COVID is over, but when you look at uh, the numbers, actually it's resurging a little bit this summer. Uh, we're seeing a rise of people who are ill. Um, thankfully, with the booster, we are seeing far fewer critically ill people, far fewer deaths, and even less hospitalization. So even though the boosters may not totally prevent you from getting it, it's going to be a mild disease if you do. Uh, so the numbers of, of uh, people who are getting really, really sick with this 
uh, are far fewer um, if they've if they've had uh, their booster. The other thing, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about long COVID symptoms, and uh, turns out that that's really a pretty significant uh, illness. Um, lots of uh, complications that that just make your life hard, make your life miserable. And the boosters, if you get if you get fully uh, immunized, fully boosted up, uh, you're much less likely to have long COVID symptoms. So that's that's really that alone makes it worth doing. Uh, it may not prevent you totally from getting COVID, uh, but it's it's going to keep you from being miserable and it's going to keep you from getting really sick. Next slide, please. Uh, what should you uh, expect? Uh, there's some people who say, you know, I got my second or I got my third shot and I was sick as a dog. Uh, is the fourth one uh, going to be the straw that broke the camel's back? And, you know, that's, that's not the experience that uh, we're seeing. The you know, side effects are generally about the same as, as with your other shots. You can expect uh, maybe some achiness, some fatigue, soreness at the site. Some people will run a, a low-grade fever uh, for 24 or 48 hours. Um, but uh, if, you, if you had you know, a reaction like that with your second or third shot and you're worried about taking the fourth, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't look like it's going to be any worse than it was before. And some people are getting it and not having much of a reaction at all. And then that makes people wonder, well, what's the point then? It's not working. I, I didn't feel anything. And that's not true. Uh, even if you don't experience any side effects at all, uh, in, in people who are in that situation, when we've tested them, they're producing adequate uh, numbers of antibodies. So uh, how you feel doesn't really reflect how well the vaccine is working. Uh, overall, these are very good vaccines. They work very well, and they're, they're pretty free of any significant uh, downside or significant side effects. And it is okay to take uh, some Tylenol or some ibuprofen over the counter if you're achy or you feel like you're feverish. Um, I, 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 I know that there are people and families uh, of elderly who are concerned about uh, you know, getting all these repeat uh, vaccines uh, and they're, they're hesitant uh, to recommend that to their loved one. But, I, I like to go back to when I was a, a kid, which was obviously quite a while ago, uh, and there was a viral illness uh, called polio that was killing lots of people, especially children, and crippling a lot of people, especially children. And I grew up in a small little town, and, and I knew three or four people, uh, kids, and a couple of adults who were paralyzed, and, and one even who died of polio. And my parents were terrified of it, as were all parents back then. Uh, they didn't really understand how you got polio. Uh, they didn't understand, you know, what was safe and what wasn't safe, and and they were afraid to let the kids play outside. They were afraid to let kids go to a swimming pool. Um, and when I was about five years old, uh, the first polio vaccine came out. And all of us kids were taken down to the city center, uh, which was a, an old building, and every kid in town was there getting uh, poked with a needle. And so kids were all bawling their eyes out. And this was back in the days when they reused needles. They just sharpened them and sterilized them again. So the needles, some of the needles were kind of dull, <laughs> but we got. Uh, we got vaccinated with them anyway. So the kids were all crying and the parents were all just happy as could be because this represented a way to keep their, their children safe. Polio was a horrible disease. So if you think about COVID in the same way, you know, we conquered polio. Polio is almost unheard of uh, in the United States now and, and vaccines work, they just do. Um, so you have to kind of keep those things in mind. Next slide. And we're really, we're doing it to, to help ourselves, but you're also doing it to protect your family members, to protect your loved ones, uh, and to protect your neighbors, and just to be a good citizen. You know, we, we do this, and it's just like following the traffic laws. You know, you follow the speed limits, you stop at stop signs, you stop at red lights, 
you yield to oncoming traffic, and it's it's just to keep everybody safe. And vaccines are the same thing. If we all do our part, then it's far harder for the virus uh, to get a foothold and, and cause us problems. So uh, I encourage everybody to check with the CDC site if it recommends that you get your booster. You know, they're, they're not hard to find. Uh, the pharmacies uh, are still uh, distributing them. Um, Moderna is coming out in August uh, with a slightly different version of their vaccine that, that covers more of the variants we've seen. Uh, and so, you know, that's something that I, we can look forward to. Uh, but they are very good vaccines, they're very safe, and they really are important, even though we're getting tired of hearing about it or tired of hearing about COVID. But uh, we, we really still need to keep all of our vaccinations uh, up to date. Shingles, uh, tetanus, uh, pneumonia, the, the annual influenza. Um, it's very important to keep us all healthy and, and to keep our communities safe. So that's it, unless I've got some questions. And uh, if you don't have any now, if you think of some later, um, you can uh, get a hold of me at Mountain Pacific Quality Health. Dr. Kunzweiler, this is Jesse. I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, have you heard any inclination if this is going to be a annual booster and if maybe the vaccine will eventually become more available like the flu vaccine where facilities can maintain their, um, their own supply a little bit more freely? Yeah, those are both really good questions. Uh, as to whether or not it's going to become annual, uh, we don't know at this point. Um, it, certainly, it's possible. Um, the The thing about influenza being annual is that it tends to mutate so much, and there are different variations of it at any one time all around the world uh, that you have to kind of stay on top of what's prevalent uh, and get uh, an immunization every year, just because it's a virus that uh, changes itself pretty quickly. We don't know yet if COVID is going to be in the same category. It, it certainly might, but it's going to take more experience with this particular virus to see what it does. Um, it may well be that we're going to need an annual booster that covers the most common variants. Um, it's kind of interesting that the, these initial vaccines that were developed uh, seem to be protecting pretty well against, you know, there have been a lot of variants already, uh, three or four that have been really prominent. And, and those initial vaccines seem to be working about equally effectively against all of them. So we might need a periodic booster, but it might not have to be annual. It, it just is, it, it's just not uh, known at this point. Um, and I think about whether, the answer to the question about whether or not vaccine will be widely available and you know, long-term care facilities, can they have it on site, that kind of thing. Uh, again, it, it's going to depend on how uh, rigid the storage requirements are and, and that kind of thing. I think it's going to be pretty widely uh, available, and the newer uh, vaccines uh, tend to be easier to handle and store, and so I think we may well see that that'll be much like the influenza. I hope that answers your questions. <laughs> And the answer yeah. is we don't know yet. <laughs> no, people thank are looking you. At it. People are looking at it. Uh, there will be an answer at some point. And, you know, it just depends on what the, what the bulk of the research shows. If it shows that our immunity wanes again and we need an annual booster, then, then that's what we have to do. But um, I, I kind of think maybe not. It might be more like every two years or something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And it looks like we have a, a couple more questions in the chat box. And as our time comes to a close, I'll just go over them quickly for everybody. Um, questions on tracking long-term care. Let's see, how are the long-term care facilities now tracking second boosters? 
it sounds like most folks are still using the Excel spreadsheet and then cross-referencing that with a birth date to determine eligibility. Um, and Kay, I agree with you, it is becoming more complicated to track. And also, what deadline, um, if any, are folks giving staff to get the second booster or get an exemption before they're no longer allowed to work? Anyone have any response on that? Feel free to, to add that in. Um, uh, that time frame is a little bit loose. I mean, the, the initial recommendation was that you wait four months uh, after your second uh, vaccination before you got the booster. Um, and they're saying basically the same thing about this second booster, but uh, in terms of optimal, um, I really haven't seen a lot of data about that. Everybody's being encouraged, um, you know, after four months to get the fourth booster if you fall into those age groups or, or other recommended groups, but it's a little bit loosey goosey. Thank you. Let's see. Okay, and it looks like um, Maria says, if not up to date, staff can work, but must be in N95 and shields. Boosters are not mandatory. Oh, and Cindy has a question. Do you think the new COVID-19 vaccine formulation will be available this fall? And I believe um, per our pharmacist last week, they, they understood it was gonna be available fall of 23. I think Moderna is talking about having their vaccine out in August. We'll see. Nice. Will that be the combo one? Do you know? Yes, it's a bi bivalent, has two different strains. And will the recommendation for co-administration of vaccines still apply? Yes. And do, okay. Um, Barb says many Alaska long-term care facilities have wrapped up vaccination tracking, uh, wrapped it into their employee health programs using um, software, which has made it easier. Yeah, it seems like going automated is really the way, or electronic is, is helpful. And uh, Dr. Kunzweiler says, Cindy wants to know, August 2022, is that when that Moderna um, vaccine is expected to be released? Yeah, that's the date that I've read. Um, I don't know how much faith to put in that, but it, that's, that's what I read. That's the rumor on the street, Cindy. So we'll see, we'll all learn together. <laughs> And does anyone know the status of Novavax? Yeah, I think it's still waiting for approval. The, the, later in July, I think it has its hearing. Okay. And then Lori made a comment that the QSO memo in March requires employees to be up to date with vaccine, have an exemption in place or not work. Yeah, thank you for the, the reference, Lori. All right, everyone. Well, it looks like um, our time together has come to an end. Uh, thank you for joining us. Stay tuned for next week, July 13th. Same time, same place. And if you have a moment, the survey link is in the chat box if you wouldn't mind taking a moment and completing that for us. I um, thank everyone for attending. And this concludes our July 6th edition of It's Worth a Shot. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.